Support for the show comes from Carolina Forward, a nonpartisan organization dedicated to building a more equitable, democratic, and prosperous North Carolina. You can learn more about their vision and values at carolinaforward.org. The North Carolina State Highway Patrol. What cigarette do you smoke, Doctor? A contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. Rock and roll has got to go. And welcome back to the Hometown Holler. I'm Daniel Ayers. And I'm Quinn Ray. Well, hey, man. And welcome to our first ever exclusive Back Porch episode. I don't think we've ever done one of these before. No, but this is exciting. I really like it. Yeah, no, this is going to be great. So if you're listening, that means you are one of our selected, beautiful, wonderful, exclusive subscribers, uh, some Patreon supporters. Well, I guess selected. I mean, we didn't select. They selected the, themselves. They sele- Self, self-selected. Self-selected. <laughs> self-selected. <laughs> right. Self-appointed. Uh, on the back porch, and um, because that that's not typically how we start the show. I mean, usually you'll, you'll say, hey, man, and I'll have some something kind of quirky to say, and I didn't do that this time, so let me just ask you this question. What is one skill that you wish you could include on your resume, but it would be weird if you did? Well, one skill that, that I currently have, mm-hmm. or just, oh, man, shoot. I think it would be that I really know how, like, I'm pretty good at dioramas. Wait, really? Yeah, I love um, putting together little scenes yeah. and doing, uh, but it's mainly, they're, they're not tiny dioramas, it'd be more about the six inch action figure yeah, diorama yeah. stuff, and uh, yeah, so like the whole Ninja Turtle sewer and all the turtles. You've done that? The, oh, dude, have I done that? Yes. That Do you is, still have them? Yes, but I don't have them out because I have kids now, yeah, so yeah, my 40 year old virgin room is taken away, <laughs> it's now a playroom, um, but yeah, that is something that... Uh, Kristen would always just be like, God, you're spending hours on setting up your figurines. That's so cool. My friends call them my dolls. If I had any, like like one of my dream jobs would be to be like at a museum, specifically a history museum, and be like the diorama designer mm. for like the battle scenes and stuff like that. So just in case Indian in the cupboard happens. Oh, for real. We are I ready. Would, like night at museum every night. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, also, did you hear about in Israel, there was a museum in like Haifa where like a four-year-old kid knocked over like a 3,000-year-old face. I did, and he didn't get in trouble for didn't it. Didn't get in trouble. They're going to like... The museum's still going to let because the, the whole thing with this museum is the artifacts are not behind a case, and they're going right. they're going to maintain that policy now. And um, I'm just amazed that like this didn't result in like the reintroduction of corporal punishment or something. Well, and, like and, that. and it like, was, I think I read where it is because it wasn't malice; it was right. a, a pure accident, and that's pure one of the joys of this museum is you get to get close to the Sometimes artifacts. Sometimes you get to go in and, and destroy a four thousand year old piece of culture and accidentally, <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if I could do that and get away with it. Probably, probably not. not. Anyway, well, we are here today with our esteemed special guest, uh, a fellow podcaster. Yes, I'm first excited. time, another first, first time we've ever had a fellow podcaster on the hometown holler. That's right. We're here with Lily Otis, who is um, doing um, doing awesome work with her podcast. Not just headlines. Is not just the headlines, or not just headlines. Not just headlines. I was right. Okay, yeah. I wanted to make yep. sure. Yeah, not just headlines. And um, rather than me give this like. Super long introduction. I think it'd be more interesting for everybody if we just kind of dive right in and, sure. just, and just start riffing. Um, folks, this is going to be a very conversational episode. Um, it's, I, I imagine it'll, it, we don't really have a, a super ironclad structure, but I imagine it'll be a lot of us talking about what got us into podcasting, why we think this work is important, what's going to happen to us after the election. And I don't mean in terms of like what's going to happen to this country, but like what happens to our podcast, right? Because right. we, you know, Lily, Quinn and I, we have these podcasts where we're talking about North Carolina politics and it's an election year. And what's going to happen when it's no longer an election year? So we'll hopefully tiptoe into that a little bit. Um, but uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and, and get this uh, starty parted. Starty parted. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on the show, Lily. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. So I, I um, we, we've already chatted a little bit, but tell us a little bit, our listeners, a little bit about, you know, um, not just headlines. That's your show. You also started it this year, just like Quinn and I started the Hometown Holler this year. So we're both kind of newcomers into this podcasting space. I think my the first thing I think folks might want to know is like, what what got you started? 
Well, I kind of give everyone a different story because it's like it's been in the works for about a year. So I will start about a year ago. I was listening. I just graduated high school and I wanted to get into politics because it would be my first year of voting. So I went to the trusted, you know, NPR. Everyone loves them. I'm like, OK, I heard a lot about NPR. And then just listening to their episodes, it was kind of discouraging because, you know, they talk about the world. And then all of a sudden I'm just hearing about war going on over here, mm -hmm. over there. And I'm like, oh, I'm not sure I want to get into politics now because it's very draining. People always say they have to turn off the news because it's just bad for their mental health. And Preach. so I was like, Ugh, I just wish there was something for younger people that was kind of like NPR and, you know, young people don't really listen to the radio like that anymore. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to kind of turn this off for a bit. And then the end of 2023 happens, 2024 happens, and the primaries get started. So we start hearing more about these politicians again. And then I'm just like hearing stuff about them, kind of like going to events sometimes, you know, stepping back into the political space. And then I'm like, okay, this is really good information. This local politics is very, very important, but there's no information to gauge people my age because even if there are events going on, you know, people have school or they have kids. And I'm like, okay, well, I can't necessarily be everywhere every single week because that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I was at an event with Tanisha Dukes, who was running yeah. for a House of Representatives seat. And she was like, you know, if you ever have something and you have a podcast, you want to interview me I was like wait that's actually a good idea so she kind of gave me that idea I never thought about starting a podcast before so she was actually my first guest and I was like you know that is the perfect medium because everyone is starting podcasts and then it's something that young people already know and then I can just interview all these politicians so that is really when it got started so around April after the primaries I wish I kind of started before the primaries because those are also important but after the primaries I really got started and then it kicked off from there what got you into wanting to be in that political space you know you just graduated high school so I grew up I've talked about it on the show before where I was in a very political household in the sense where I'm always going to vote with my parents, my grandparents worked the polls. What struck, did you scroll across your TikTok or Instagram and started just being inundated by influencers, kind of like what we're doing now? Or what kind of just headed you in that direction of being politically aware? I think I think what he's asking is, at what point did you see a hometown holler reel and look at Quinn and be like, I like, I like what he's doing. That's I like right. his That's right. Grateful Dead tie-dye shirt. I want to do that. <laughs> Yeah, it was actually none of that. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom is a little bit of a Karen, so she's always calling people about some problems. So Asking I'm always, to speak to the manager. Yes, exactly. So she calls and she asks to speak to the, her city council members all of the time. They're like, my trash didn't get picked up. Why can't I bring my bag into the Coliseum? All of the time. So then I started to, she started to develop these relationships with local politicians because <laughs> she was always calling their phones, talking to them. You got a local politician right here laughing. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we call an engaged citizen. Yes, yes. that's right. A yes. constituent. <laughs> yes. So I was always hearing those calls, and then my mom got to know them. So then I got to know them a little bit more as I got older being around them. So it was kind of like, oh, I already see these people. Let me just go ahead and interview them because I kind of already know them, if that makes sense. But how did you know it was in? important or like this work was important to just, just hearing them talk and I'm like oh my gosh that actually is very important what's going on in our schools and then no one knows this information because then I'm like I'm in this special position that if I wasn't in these rooms with these people mm -hmm. I wouldn't have necessarily known it so it was kind of like I felt this True. obligation to let other people know these things because unless you were in the room people don't know what they don't know right do you find that lots of the I mean you could let me back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. You kind of got interested or your interest was peaked about a year ago. Yes. And then, um, you know, launched the podcast in April. But in, in, the, in the intervening time, you know, in, those, in the months in between, you were following local politics, um, learning more. It was, it was, your interest was snowballing. Was it tough to, like, engage your friends about it or, like, mm -hmm. get other folks? Like, before the podcast, before you had a medium to reach other people, was it difficult to, like, Go to your friend at school or like, you know, hanging out someday and be like, hey, I don't know if you know this, but the city council is voting on X, Y, Z. And your friend is like, I don't care. Well, I feel like for a lot of Gen Z's, we um, grew up with the 
not grew up, but a lot of the Black Lives Matter stuff happened, so they engaged that way. And then after um, the October event, people were engaging even more, so they were kind of, you know, on that um, global, like knowing about the global mm -hmm. stuff, so they are kind of already engaged in knowing about stuff, but it was kind of like, um, getting their attention to the local side, mm -hmm. like you're saying. So I was never really thinking about engaging people that I knew because, you know, they were always focused on all the other right, wars. Right, they're doing their own thing. Yeah. yeah, and then when I was like, did, when I voted in the primaries, I had my, I voted sticker. I was like, oh my gosh, again, this is important. People don't know that all these things impact them. So I was kind of on my personal Instagram page posting and being like, hey guys, it's important to vote about this, vote about that. And of course they like scroll through it for a second. And mm -hmm. I was like, no, I really want you guys to actually know this. But like, they're I like, mean it. yeah, but they're like, okay, we have no time. There's nowhere for us to actually get this information. So I was like, okay, then I will do it. So it was really after those primaries where I really saw how important it was that I was like, okay, they they say they kind of want to get engaged, but let me like kind of give them all this information and so much easier than it's already available to them. So it wasn't that folks were, you know, not interested, mm -hmm. but that um, like as who was it who said this recently? I, some, it may be somebody at the DNC. I can't remember who it was, but like you, you got to put the hay where the goats can get to it. Mm. Right. True, true. You, you know, it, it's it's not that it's not that people don't want to hear about local politics or aren't interested. But yeah, it is it is hard to find places where those conversations are happening. And then when you find those conversations, do, are they interesting? Yeah, you know, I'm trying to think back to, to my high school and, um, and, and trying with, with yours. So our last presidential election, 2020, you, you weren't in school because it was COVID. And so I remember when my first uh, election, shoot, it was uh, 20, two, two, uh, 2004. And, um, you know, I was in AP history, U.S. history, mm -hmm. and we discussed what was happening, yeah. right? We, we talked about the process. And so it just kind of engaged me a little bit, prepared me um, and my colleagues or my, my fellow students were talking about politics and a mm -hmm. presidential election where this first group that gets like your, your class, um, they didn't get to have that in high school. So you're not l learning, I guess, or actually um, dialoguing with your, your fellow peers at a, at a younger age to try to get you involved other than just social media scrolling and, I don't know if it's a luckily, but like you said earlier, the Black Lives Matter, you know, kind of coincided with mm -hmm. that first, your first presidential election, I guess, uh, when you're of relevant age of understanding what's happening. And so, yeah, I, I'm very curious to see after this election, how many 19 year olds actually go and vote. What, what do you think? I mean, your friend group right now, are they... Or, Speak for every 19 year old ever. <laughs> I know that's a lot of yeah. weight, but, but your, your friend group since, yeah. since starting this podcast and do you, showing do you it, think that there's going to be, are they going to go out of the polls? I, I think so, mm -hmm. but I feel like I'm a little biased yeah. because I mean, sample know, size and all that, but like, you, are you, are you sensing that there's energy in your, in your, the circles you run in? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Is that, I mean, a lot of energy, I think is a result of Biden left the race, mm -hmm. Kamala Harris joined the race as you know, top of the ticket, and there's been this huge resurgence of enthusiasm um, on, the, on the left side of the political spectrum. Would you say like that's, I mean, were, were they excited with Biden before he dropped out? Or were they excited with Trump and still are or, or Yeah, I'm, I'm making a lot of assumptions here. Um, well, of course it was funny. So with young people, <laughs> they don't really take these things seriously <laughs> sometimes. So it was just the memes about, you know, Joe Biden being off in yeah. his own world and mm -hmm. all of this stuff. But as soon, as, yep, as soon as he dropped out, though, I feel like there was this energy of like more like, OK, what do we want this country to be now? Because it was actually had a chance to be taken more seriously. Not that mm -hmm. it wasn't necessarily as serious with Biden, but it was kind of like seen as like a joke with the memes about the debate and all that mm -hmm. stuff. But when we got Kamala, it was like, OK, we're kind of serious again and we're kind of back on this track so it engaged them and all of us to look okay now let's really really see what we want now now that we don't like just make a joke out of everything yeah for sure i, mean, I guess it makes sense for yeah. sure yeah i did you watch any of the dnc i watched a little bit of it yeah. i didn't watch all of it yeah i mean it was, yeah, it was super it was, super it was, long yeah. and like the first night went i mean it was like biden was speaking at like midnight or something yeah <laughs> what, what did you think of what you saw 
Um, I thought it was a lot of energy, um, mm -hmm. especially with being at in-person rallies. You know, I was kind of talking to my mom because, again, I'm new about, you know, all this political stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was like, OK, kind of what's the purpose of all of this stuff? But she was really explaining to me, like, you have to get people motivated and excited to come out to vote. So yeah. you have all these people with the like minded ideology coming mm -hmm. together. And I was like, OK, this energy looks really, really cool. And what they're saying is like you could tell they really wanted young people to come out to vote as well because they were trying to engage the audience as well. So I was really excited about the energy that was being shown. Yeah, it's like a giant pep rally. Yeah. Yeah, I was really nervous about what was going to happen at the DNC, especially after seeing the RNC because mm -hmm. the RNC, I mean. It was good. Yeah, dude, I would I mean, like, it would have been a party there. Mm -hmm. I, it, it seemed like it was Except for the roll call. Did you see the roll call? I did see their roll call, but, you know, I didn't know anything – could be different until I saw this last oh roll call from the DNC, gosh, right? That, the DNC yeah. roll call this year was like one of the weirdest things I saw or that I felt was different from the RNC and the DNC was during the RNC, Trump sat in his little spot with right. his family the whole time mm -hmm. as if he was this like the Roman Emperor of the Coliseum. Yes, yes yeah. and just watching over it his did peons. Have, and yeah. we, we didn't see that with uh, Kamala and Walls doing mm -hmm. this. I do think it was an awesome troll movement moment when they uh, did accepted her as the nominee and she was in Minnesota what was it Minnesota? In, in Wisconsin. She was Wisconsin, right across the border, yeah. Um, where they had the orange like twice as many people. Yes, yeah, exactly. At the, at the same time I, I thought that was a very smart move on their end. Um but Lily. Mm-hmm. So you started this podcast. How? Wh where can people listen to you, and how do people stumble? Well, what is your way of getting people to your podcast? Because I think that's something Daniel and I try to not try, but we we struggle with. Mm -hmm. With how do we direct them? Do we do it from our social? Do we try to get them to our website and then to we our put stickers on every gas station between <laughs> right. Greensboro we... and Chapel Hill? Right. Right. <laughs> Well, I would say for me, there's been a few different approaches. I keep, you know, trying and shifting and changing to see what will work. My main approach with social media is just so the things that I can't necessarily go in depth about in my actual episodes, like stuff like the types of ID, all of that information where they go to the um, information, they can kind of get the get information about like where to go, how to do it, their plans about election day and all of that stuff. So it's a little bit more about gaining like them getting information on things they've never heard about because they might not know you need an ID to vote mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And then my in-person approach is I go to a lot of events for sure, but I connect with different organizations who um, like You Can Vote and the NAACP join their political action committee. And then I share my information that way. So when they are actually going out, I don't have to do as much work. I can just send my information out with them that way. And then of course, getting on campuses and stuff, I do a little bit of um, public speaking in front of the students. So, you know, they have those lists of people who are eligible to vote on election day. So I just go into them and just show them what it's about. But it's really important to tell them why it's important to vote mm. local because, of course, they hear it their whole life to go vote, go vote. It's going to change their whole lives. But then I really like, I kind of look like them because I'm their age mm -hmm. and I really want to get through their head. Like, yes, this is this is something that's like you're in a privileged position to have all these resources available to you. And it's such like getting this opportunity to vote in this way and listen to interviews from candidates. So I really like try to cater to each person's like it, like if I'm mm. going out speaking to people, really gauge why that person doesn't necessarily seem or know why it's important to vote because everyone has their own individual reasons. So I kind of try and cater to that audience, if that makes sense. It does. I really appreciate that approach because it, it's that's a long road, right? Yes. I mean, you're only one mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. and individual approaching will take a long time to move, but I appreciate it because I agree with you. I think that one-on-one -on -one conversation really changes a life and I think a ripple effect is real. You know, one, one little pebble can mm -hmm. definitely uh, make it to the ocean. Where, where do you get your news? Like you, you kind of talked about like NPR and, you mm -hmm. know, like how kind of exhausting and stressful it can be to listen to, to certain news sources. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, if if one of the things, you know, you, you do, or and maybe this isn't something you do, but like one of the things we kind of do, I, you know, is, is, is interpret news. I wouldn't mm -hmm. call us, we are not journalists. Yeah, Billy Ball was trying to say we, we, we are. Yeah, we're not and journalists. Not not quite yet. Not no. that we don't aspire to try to get to that level. But I mean, yeah, I, don't, not. I don't feel like I'm reporting. I'm, I'm interpreting or commenting. 
Mm -hmm. um, but which which still involves reading the news. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, what what maybe some of your favorite news sources are, and and this is as much for me, just because I'm curious if there are other places I should be looking. Um, well, I downloaded this app recently called Ground News. I don't know if you've heard of it, but I have not. But it's like you basically go on there and you see like a different like headline or the topic, and then it says how much of the left agrees with it, how much of the right, and then how much is kind of like neutral. So you can like pick different topics, whether it's celebrity or like world or like the general election, and it kind of like gauges for you like okay, how much of the left is agreeing with it, what percentage, and how much of the right is agreeing with it and kind of their thoughts on it so that's kind of where i get some of that non-partiality from yeah <laughs> and then of course like on youtube there's a ton of independent journalism that isn't necessarily from cnn or fox news that kind of gets filtered a little bit so i do look on youtube sometimes to like see some independent journalists but other than that i don't try to um put it too much in my brain because you know it does mm -hmm. get exhausting but Man, i do want to like keep up yeah. well and i think that you know the difference between us is like the hometown holler and your podcast is like we might take a topic mm -hmm. and uh, dive into it mm -hmm. where i feel like you're right now your goal is to just give people a, if, if you're interviewing a candidate right just letting the candidate have a platform kind of have mm -hmm. their platform mm -hmm. but then when you speak it's more about just get involved like i don't care if you're right or left but you need to get involved because this is a, this affects you. You know, I, I go back to what you said. I grew up with it always being, you know, you got to vote because it's important and it's going to affect your life. Really, you know what? It doesn't really matter who's president right now for us. Um, it, I think it's more important who's going to be North Carolina's governor and who's going to be our House of Representatives and our Senates in, in North or, Carolina. Or county commissioners. Or county, man, man, school I was, boards. I was, yeah, I was talking to a, a former student of mine recently. This is her first election, um, incidentally. And I, I, she didn't even know she was registered to vote because, mm. you know, you, you can get registered mm -hmm. to the DMV. And I was like, oh, like, are you going to vote? And she's like, well, yeah, I got to register first. And I was like, well, I think you might already be. And we, like, sure enough, we checked, and she's registered. And... Um, she we don't even, do automatic registering in North Carolina, do we? No, I think they asked her at the DMV. They mm -hmm. were like, would you like to register? And she said yes. And I think she expected that there would be like subsequent paperwork to fill out. Mm -hmm. But they just like do it for you. And, yeah, and, but, but they got to at least ask you your partisanship. Um, they might have they asked do. her. Yeah, they do. She was unaffiliated. I mean, we, I mean, we, I checked her on the voter rolls and like she was registered unaffiliated. So I think maybe it just kind of happened fast. And she, it was, I think it was maybe simpler than she expected. Mm -hmm. And, oh. and I mean, I mean, yeah, it, I, again, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't yeah, there with her, I don't know, but she was surprised that she was registered to vote, and uh, we were talking about it, and, and, and her mom is a sheriff's deputy here in Alamance County, and, you know, I don't know if, I mean, you know, anybody who's watched the county commissioner's meetings, you know, Sheriff Johnson has talked a lot about how there's a lot of understaffing, mm -hmm. um, there's staffing shortages at the jail, and, and, her, and she, this, this, it was interesting, because I've always heard that talked about at the county commissioner's meetings, but then to meet the daughter of a sheriff's deputy, who's talking about it, mom comes home from work. And talks about that experience. Talks about you know I'm at you know so and so was telling me they were working at the jail and we don't have enough folks to cover this shift right. So to, to hear that kind of issue talked about like on, as a kitchen table issue mm -hmm. was really interesting. And then to tell her you know the president doesn't decide how many people are at the elements, right, you know right. like those are county commissioner funding decisions. And we had this really cool conversation. I should even get her to do a reel or something because it was a really it was one of those moments where I was like it's happening, politics mm -hmm, is happening. Mm -hmm. So that was really exciting. Um, Lily, I would like to take uh, ask you your take when it comes to voting. Um, so we just interviewed Dr. Sarah Tabor, and you know she's running for um, commissioner of agriculture. And surprisingly, um, she said, you know, that is one of the positions where people just kind of blindly pick. Um, well, to actually, show their nonpartisanship. Yeah, right. Like people like will vote Democrat. You know, let's say the entire ticket, and then get to. The commissioner of agriculture and go well that just feels like an a, a good place for me to kind of uh compromise right right like right. i vote a democrat every other office like i'll vote republican for this one mm -hmm. so i can essentially tell people honestly i'm a bipartisan voter right yeah do you so we have partisanship on ballot so it can show people that you know even if you don't know this person you kind of have an idea of where their morals are and their platform and what do you tell people when they say you know, I know who the president is, or the two candidates for president. I know the candidates for governor, but I don't know all these other positions. Do you tell them 
to skip it? Like, like, how would you solicit that? How would you do that? Listen to my podcast. Yeah, <laughs> there we it. go. Listen to my episode. Um, but I definitely think these politicians can explain their position better than me. But um, I do at this point have like a basic general idea of each one. So I kind of, um, again, on my Instagram, that's where I try to have my information. So I have a highlight that kind of explains every single position on the ballot. But if they do have a question like that, I do kind of just like name off some things that like um, that they said that necessarily that I'm not super knowledgeable about, but I always reference them back to the episode because I'm like, that person knows a lot more. And you'd be surprised how much people know about these positions. Like they kind of do know. Like I was surprised that people even knew about the commissioner of agriculture because I had no idea. So right. really people know a lot more than we're giving them credit for, for real. I don't know if I agree. Well, for the people I speak with, mm -hmm. I feel like. Yeah. I mean, and I think, I, I would agree in that sense, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think we're kind of all in the same space of where we're speaking to politically aware folks, somewhat politically aware folks. But I think if we just went on the street right now in downtown Burlington and asked them who's running for commissioner of or insurance. Or who's running for governor even. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that I would give the governor. I, I mean, yeah. I, I think mm -hmm. I think most folks, but like I, I, it's not been in the past month or so, but like. I remember back in like June, I did meet somebody who like didn't know who Josh Stein was, knew who Mark Robinson was, sure, but like didn't sure. know who Josh Stein was. That um, checks out. Yeah, I mean, and and, and, so, <laughs> and and like and so like that and th but that to me, I was you know it was a good reminder that like I'm inhabiting a kind of a different universe. Like when you're a nerd about local politics and state politics, right? You, it's it's easy to forget. You well, know? I, I know for me, um, when I would vote, so you know started voting, you know a little bit ago, and uh, if I didn't know who it was. And I didn't know. I would just, on. I mean, this this is honest. Uh, I, if there was a uh, two candidates, I didn't know who either were. Can I guess what you what you're gonna yeah. do? Did you just vote for whoever you thought had the better name? Um, I would. Well, that was number two. Number one was I would vote for whoever uh, was a female. Okay. Right, woman. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if it was two guys, I would mm -hmm. pick whoever's name was cooler. Yeah. And that was not cool. Like, I don't appreciate myself for doing that. Um, so I, at some points I was just like, maybe I should just skip it. Maybe i if I don't know either one of them, but now it's not the case for me, especially in this election. Yeah. I think I might've done that once too, but it, it wasn't like, it was like in a midterm or something. And it was one of the, I mean, this sounds horrible. I'm confessing this, but yeah, I think I was like a relatively new vote, new voter, new voter. And I was in there and there was like an office or two that I was like, it was a lot of people, and I was like, I don't know. I mean, and this is also before every candidate had like a website, you mm -hmm. know, because like for mm -hmm. some, because before the I mean, the internet was around, right? But like this would have been like 2014, and if you're running for school board, you may or may not have had a website, right? And so it's tough to know. Like I didn't get the brochure; there wasn't anybody at the polls handing this out. So I get there, and it's like, well, and some of these races are nonpartisan, so you just there's not a whole lot you can go on besides like that person's name is kind of a pun. I like it. So I guess that's why you kind of started this podcast as well with what you're doing is uh, I think we all share the same idea of we want the voters to be more educated about who they're voting for. And it is so daggum hard to be educated about. I voted for Amy Gailey the very first time she ran for county commissioner. And she ran a great campaign, though. Mm. Alamance Amy. Well, she and she was she touted pro education, mm -hmm. right? And that that's what I was about. I was pro education. I, and at the time, I didn't care if you're an R or a D. Um, but I think it's a very important job what we're doing. I, I think everybody starts a podcast. Um, anybody can do it. It's just like everybody starting a garage band. But I think our motives and your motives are really to try to help the community, help move democracy? Am I kind of hitting on the right page? Yeah, like, absolutely. What, um, what do you feel is that you want people to get out of your podcast, your listeners? Wow, I just, I don't want them to just vote based on the name, you know? Right. I want them to actually say that, like, I've heard this person's voice. I know a little bit about them. I'm making an educated vote and I'm not skipping any names. So whether they decide they like the person that they're listening to or not, at least they know that. At least they know mm -hmm. I know this politician now and I don't like what they have to say. So that is my main goal. And hopefully when election day comes, we see it happen, but people aren't skipping names on the ballot.
ballot. So I really want them to actually know and hear the voice of the person they're voting for. How do you decide who comes on your show? Anyone. I just, <laughs> I just like if you're running for a position, um, I, I want to hear your um, platform and your policy and what you have to say. And then other people can listen to that, whether they have something good to say or not. That's what they want to put out there. So I really just want to focus local, of course, but then also um, people that people don't generally know about, like the commissioner of insurance I interviewed yesterday or two days ago that people. She's awesome, isn't yes, she? Yes, that people genuinely don't typically know about but it's not technically local but we can still get those names out there so i really just want to engage anyone who's willing to speak to me of course you probably guys probably have run into this issue that some people just don't want to talk or engage yeah, people but i at least try to ask everyone so then that way they can say that hey i don't want to engage young people mm -hmm. i don't want to come and explain my platform and then i'll be like okay that person didn't get an interview because they don't want to. Right. Mm -hmm. So you send out, do you send out mass emails to people? You're like, all right, we're going to do all of the Guilford County commissioners candidates. And you just blast them all and say, hey, you want to come on the show? So it started off with people that I knew typically. And then I would um, contact the person who they're running against just so I can say, like, I reached out to them. You can get both sides. If they don't answer, that's on them. So I do Good emails. I call. I do all of that stuff. So I'll be like, I emailed, I called, da, 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 da. and sometimes people don't get it and I have to go out to events and I see them in person and then that works a little bit better. So then I go through people I know, their opponents, and then I do some more research out at events. I meet people and then they tell their friends. Um, I think I was at Kamala Harris back when she was, back when Joe was still running and she was just coming as the VP. And there was someone in line who was running for um, a position. And she's like, oh, what do you do? I'm like, oh, yeah, I have this podcast. And then I got her on the show, but she wasn't necessarily in like, my county, which is Guilford County. So she's like, oh, can I still come on? I was like, sure, absolutely. And then she told other people. So it's kind of – so it kind of snowballs into like a, a word of mouth thing. Mm -hmm. It's crazy that I have candidates every single week. Like I haven't skipped a week somehow, but like it just keeps coming somehow. But I definitely try to reach out every single way possible just so I can say that I'm nonpartisan and I didn't just reach out to this side or that side. Is, is there anybody that, or any, not may, maybe any specific person, but any type of person, or is, there, is there any situation where you could imagine yourself saying, no, I prefer to not have this person on the show. No, I don't think so because I don't know anything again. Like I'm I'm also doing this so I can learn as mm -hmm. well. So I have no idea about people unless I actually hear about them. And of course, people are like, "Oh, my candidates like this or that." And then I give them a chance to speak as well, but I don't think I've ever like really turned away anyone but i do prior prioritize people who are actually running this election because mm -hmm. of course other politicians want to come on mm -hmm. and i could do like a little special episode mm -hmm. but i don't think so because again they probably just don't engage me at all if i'm being for real like yeah. i probably just reach out and i get ghosted right mm -hmm. yeah we've, we've had that too we're like there's so many folks we'd love to have on but because it's an election year mm -hmm. and just time and energy it's all it's just so limited right um you know so we don't much. have a staff of people running this show it's just us and we have other commitments and you know jobs and things like that we got to do so it's just tough to, to kind of triage that follow up on daniel's question though let's say mark robinson reaches out and wants to be on the show are we having them on your show? Are you doing it? I would love to because from what he content. has to say, <laughs> yeah, I'm about to say from what he has to say, a lot of people either find it entertaining or don't necessarily agree with it. Mm. So I'm like, okay, then let him say that. And then this other audience, I feel like um, if these people aren't gen generally like the most, um, what's the word? Um, so they ethical in a way, mm -hmm. then that's going to come off in the way that they do their episodes. It's kind of hard to hide that part mm -hmm. of yourself. So I'm like, okay, if that's what they want to portray, then go ahead. So if Mark Robinson wants to come on my podcast, of course, I'll be great PR for me, first of sure. all. Yeah. And then I'm just like, okay, if he has all these things that he says that people don't really necessarily agree with, then they're probably not going to agree with it on my platform, but at least more people know. Yeah. What do you feel like your role is as the podcaster and interviewer? So let's say Mark comes on the show and he starts saying things that are just blatantly untrue, right? Is it, do you feel like it's your duty to be like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Mark, like 
that's not so like factual. like not 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 things that like you may disagree with, but just like things that like you know to be untrue. Correct. Yeah. Like if it's mm-hmm. just a, a blatant lie that you know, like what... I fought in Desert Storm. It's like <laughs> yeah. you didn't. Or yeah. or <laughs> if he's saying you know Democrats are wanting to have abortions after the baby's born, and you're like, yeah, right. <laughs> no, bro. Like that's not mm-hmm. happening. Um, do you feel it's a, a podcaster's duty to stop that, or do we just let it go? So I do this thing. Um, I let it go the episode, and then at the end of the episode, depends on the candidate, but I go through and I kind of like debrief every single thing that I said in the mm-hmm. questions. So, um, of course, I let them speak, and then I don't want to like, since kind of tell people what to think in the moment, or because it's hard to like, not come off non-biased with my tone so i kind of mm-hmm. let it sit research the things they say and then i kind of at the end of the episode i'm like okay guys let's talk about this episode right, okay, let's circle back. Yeah. exactly i asked this question because i wanted to see how he would answer in this sort of way he answered like this let's see if this was necessarily true would you want to vote for a person who gave you this information in this way mm-hmm. so i kind of don't like grill them in the moment but i definitely depending on the candidates i love doing it sometimes because i'm like Ugh, i kind of love going in and d- dissecting sure. what they say mm-hmm. but i do that afterwards so i'm not pushing people towards the idea but kind of training them on how they should think about the things that were said mm-hmm. that makes good sense I, I appreciate that and, you know and i guess the the question from my question stemmed from the the debate between mm-hmm. trump and biden right mm-hmm. where cnn the moderators just let trump just spout lies and it's like you know like yeah. you need to mm-hmm. stop him because it's not, in, in my opinion, it's it's not right to just be able to put stuff out. But you say you do this, but afterwards you, you debrief it. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. That's something we could potentially try to do. Yeah, and I also think it's really different, you know, when, like, on a podcast as opposed to, like, you know, a national debate where I think the purpose of the, the podcast is is really just to, like, let, like you were saying, I, sh- I should say one purpose because I think there are many different approaches to it. But one approach is to just let the candidate kind of riff. And then, like you said, you circle back and kind of give your interpretation of it. Whereas, like, in like a real-time debate, you know, you, you, there is kind of an expectation. That, like, look, there are rules, and some of those rules involve us not lying mm-hmm. or, you know, just, just <laughs> say, saying things that are completely untruthful. And, and, you know, a debate is, I think, a more structured experience than a sure, podcast sure. conversation. And there, there are rules, and, 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 and in theory, the moderators are the referees that enforce those rules, right? Whereas, 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 whereas in a podcast, it can be more conversational and kind of more of a, um, I don't know, it, it just, just, I'll, you know, let this person talk and then move on to the next question. And then when we're done, if my audience is interested, I'll give my take. So we haven't had a... Um an opposing view, I guess, on our show, Not the yet. candidate yet. Yeah. Um, we're, we're in the works. We're trying to do it. We sent out um, emails to all the candidate of the state, um, can- all the council of state candidates, Democrats and Republicans. But you, on your show, um, you, you know, if you go to your your socials and stuff, in bold letters, is non biased, right? We're we're really trying to be nonpartisan, and I have a tough time, and I want to know how you do it, where. I just have a feeling if somebody comes on our show, we can have different viewpoints, right? I can I can get down with that. But when they say something ridiculous, how do you not just be like you dumb <laughs> shit, right? Like how, how do you do it? Like how yeah, do you we, keep we, that? We took because we talked a lot. Uh, we talked about this a lot when we were like going to start a podcast because it was like we we don't want. I mean, the, the world is filled with like partisan hacks, sure. people on either side of the aisle who will just cheerlead for that team and their team can do no wrong the other team can do no right and we we didn't want to be that but but we ought we but we both um identify in terms of the policies we support with the fairly left of center yeah, yeah. uh world view so it was like how how do we not fall into like the partisan hackery but also stay true to our own values and i think what we decided was ultimately that like um we would be fairly upfront in terms of our values, but but that there's a way to do that that doesn't involve being partisan. Sure. But so how, how do you yeah, do how, it? how do you yeah how do you walk that line? Um. Yeah, this is interesting. So almost like all the time, there are um, people who I don't agree with 
their what their policies are, their ideas. And I think it's like a fun little game for my mom to listen to the episodes <laughs> because she knows my family are pretty much the only people who really know my ideas politically. So like on my social media, I keep it out. Even on my personal um, Instagram page, I don't talk politics or like my own ideology. I do post like memes and stuff, of, like like cute little like fan fiction stuff mm-hmm. of like the presidential debate. And I'm like, this is so funny. But um, I do keep my own personal stuff out of it and try to, like, do that the whole entire time. So um, and then I just when I was approaching this, I wanted to keep this on the focus of this is not about me because I don't want them to vote because of what I have to say, but because of what they have to say, because even after they stop listening to me, I still want them to be trained on what they want. And that's kind of like know? oxymoronic with a yeah. podcaster not being I know. about me. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a whole new area of podcasting. Yeah. So I just want to train them to think about, OK, if you believe in this, do you like the way this person is going to have it done for you? Mm-hmm. Not necessarily about what I believe in it, about it to be, if that makes sense. Sure. So I really try to be like, OK, this is not about me pushing my ideas on anyone because everyone already kind of has their ideas that they have. And that they, um, everyone knows what they believe in, essentially. So I'm not really have to convince anybody of that. I'm just reinforcing to find that person who has that same idea as you. So if you do um, support reproductive health rights, I'm trying to bring you that politician that has that same ideology, not for me to like bring my own thoughts and ideas to it, if that makes sense. So my kind of like nonpartisan is not just about not endorsing any candidates, but not like saying, because if people, you know, if if you know you're um, someone that you really care about is voting for this person, you're probably going to like be more open to listening to like, hey, why? Because I really respect your opinion. So I'm kind of going to be more open to why you think you should vote for that candidate. So I kind of like try to take myself out of that and then eventually when I'm bigger probably doing some more of that but especially at the beginning that can like be like oh she thinks this way I'm not going to listen to her whether versus it being like oh I'm just going to go in trying to search for you know my ideology Mm -hmm. so I don't want them to like go to my page and automatically be turned off by my ideas yeah People go to our page. I was going to say, turned over real <laughs> that way happens to us, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Absolutely. But well, I think what's funny is like the stuff you, you've noted this, Quinn, like I'll post something that is um, actually like fairly, in my opinion, like pretty balanced and moderate and like seeking common ground. Like after the Trump assassination, like I posted just kind of like, which, which was what I think virtually every Democrat said, which was like, this is not good. We can't be right. having, vol- you know, violence has no place in politics. This is, this is horrible i'm so glad he's safe um regardless of how i feel about his policies and we lost a lot of followers over yep. that it was just it was like it was interesting because i was like that's the one that's gonna lose people like that <laughs> right. was that was the one like the most i thought that was like the most least controversial thing i could have said and i mean that's just showing that yeah, there, where there we are extremes yeah. where on especially on social media right a lot of people can be um, but we're almost coming up on time, yep. Lily. I have a, another question, and I think it's a question for, for all of us here to kind of talk about. Because you, you mentioned earlier when you get bigger. Um, what what happens with the podcast mm-hmm. after the election, right? I mean, I think that's something Daniel and I were, were planning on season two. Um, and what does it look like? What does after November 5th look like to, for you? Well, it's going to be fun and interesting, especially since I said that I don't push any of my own ideology, so it's going to be hard to, like, talk about anything specifically. But I don't want to lose my audience for sure, and I do want to continue to bridge that gap between young people engaging in politics, especially locally. So kind of having that medium where, I guess, essentially... um, Young people want to be heard and have their voices, but they also want to be informed voters. And every year is essentially an election year. So I want to continue to be like, especially after this election year, since everyone's engaged, kind of be like, okay, you guys have heard from all these people. Let's see what they're actually doing now. And like, okay, this person that you heard this episode from, they just passed this thing, which is totally um, 
contrary to what they told you guys. Mm -hmm. So pay attention to that. So I really want to um, kind of do a journalistic approach, mm -hmm. but not completely, where I'm giving the young people this information, but on a local level, so they can continue to follow up with these politicians. And then, of course, we can still continue to interview people who are going to be running for city council, county commissioners, et cetera, even after this election. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so kind That's of connect those dots, accountability. Yes. I, 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 that's great. Yeah, I think I think there's a you'll be very busy. Yes. I think there's a lot you can do there. There is there without a doubt. Willie, thank you so much for coming on the hometown holler. This has yeah. been and we'll tell you what's really cool. We got these awesome sweaters, y'all. <laughs> like <laughs> usually we're the ones yes. giving away t-shirts, and which by the way, you get a, you get a hometown holler oh t-shirt in, in exchange for your beautiful sweaters. So these for, say vote local, not just headlines. Yeah, and it's yeah. awesome. Like they're black on this this pink. Fuchsia. It's got like a cool I mean, Barbie feel. Yeah. Dude, I, I feel I feel cool it. when I wear it. I didn't know how you guys would feel about the color. I'm like, oh. I don't know about. I mean, no, nah, dude, this is this is so this is like this it. is our vibe oh, for sure. Mean, Daniel can take uh, internet trolls about painting his fingers. He can wear. Mm. Oh yeah, that's a whole color. other podcast episode. <laughs> I painted my fingernails, and uh, you would have thought that like I had been. You know uh, that they had found like the skulls of children in my fridge. Like it was, it was crazy. Just the amount of hate I got. Oh my gosh. Um. Anyway, well, anything else you want to add for our listeners before? Yeah. We where sign can they off? find you? Where can we? Um... Well, um, I'm not just Headlines Pod on Instagram, and of course, I'm on um my podcast is on Spotify, Apple Music, um Apple Music, Apple Apple Podcast, <laughs> Apple yeah, podcast yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Amazon Music is what I meant to say, Audible, all of those platforms, and of course, you can follow me and keep up even after the election day, and just make sure to vote local, not just Headlines. That's right, man. She is so good. She looked right at the camera. <laughs> I was gonna like, say we've never had somebody do that. Nah, yeah, man, we uh, are totally true out of podcaster. Our level. Yes, she's got. <laughs> It. Awesome. Lily, Lily, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye. Support for the show comes from Carolina Forward, a nonpartisan organization dedicated to building a more equitable, democratic, and prosperous North Carolina. You can learn more about their vision and values at carolinaforward.org. The North Carolina State Highway Patrol. What cigarette do you smoke, Doctor? A contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. Rock and roll has got to go. And welcome back to the Hometown Holler. I'm Daniel Ayers. And I'm Quinn Ray. 